This is Journal Club in the Advanced Science Academy at Morris Catholic. Today, Richard C. Sidoli the third. He earned that three. Anyway, uh, RC is going to be presenting a paper, which is, let's see if I can get this to work. Comparative genomics reveals convergent evolution between the bamboo eating giant and red pandas. This is from 2017. It's a little later than we usually do, but I thought it was a pretty interesting paper. Uh, Lila got to hear some of the discussion yesterday uh, while we were trying to figure out some things on it. And I want to reiterate with you guys that the the point of this is, I think I, I think I said this to Andy this morning, I don't expect you to understand this perfectly. I don't understand this perfectly. RC doesn't understand this perfectly. The, the whole point of this is that a group of people with, with some knowledge in different areas will overlap enough that we might be able to understand it as a group. This is how real science is done. So I believe that learning science means doing science. This is a major part. Okay, Communicating science is a, is a fundamental piece. If you're not good at communicating science or you show no effort in a lower level class, you don't get invited to AMI at all. Okay. All right. So, RC, take it away. Uh, so, yeah, this is comparative genomics reveals convergent evolution between bamboo eating giant pandas and red pandas. Did it shift? Yes, it did. It all right. Yeah. Uh, so, these two species, while well, they're both called pandas, aren't actually that closely related. Uh, if you look over here, this is a just a general phylogenetic tree of mammals. So you can see there's like a split here where all mammals branch out. And the both species end up down here. But if you look here, what's missing is the Ursidae, which is the bear family. And you can see that there's a split here between the Ursidae and then the actual like other branches to Musta, Mustelidae, which is where the red panda is. This shows this a bit more clearly. So there's this split here. So pandas, all other, like giant pandas, the other bears, all split off. And this is around, uh, this says 35, but it's actually 47 million years ago, which the paper comes to address. And this splits off here into actual giant pandas and red pandas. And they're both called pandas because they are very similar in a lot of different regards. So I'm assuming whoever was naming them, whenever they named it, just assumed they were associated. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with their environment, which ends up leading to what the paper deals with, uh, convergent evolution. The Did it shift? Uh, so this figure, uh, this is figure one, which is just showing the, uh, this is showing the phylogenetic tree more detailed. So this is giving you the actual times of like the split and these numbers here, the plus and minus, uh, supposedly, so it's supposed to refer to gene loss and gene gain. They call it uh, expansion and contraction. So it's saying that 400 or 4,693, usually it would be genes. Um, I talked to Dr. Char about this, but it says of gene family. So we don't know exactly what they're trying to say here. It's presumably, though, just some sort of genetic information being lost or gained between a common ancestor. That's and a way to put it. and uh, before this actual study, they didn't have any genomic information on the red panda, and they ended up having to do a, a, a de novo gene um it's a compilation where they pretty much mapped most of the genome of the red panda. And based on that information, they ran older genes through a simulated evolution. And they determined that it's most likely that the split between uh, red panda and giant panda occurred uh, 47.5 million years ago, whereas before they thought it was only around 43. Uh, and then this is showing an actual anatomical similarity between the two, despite their uh, distance in terms of genetic relation. They both have this bone that isn't actually a digit, but 
simulates a lot of the function of a digit. They end up calling it a pseudo thumb in the paper. And they go into how it developed and why they think it might have actually developed in such a manner. Yeah, can you go back to that for a second? Yeah. I just want to make make that point uh, again. One of the <clears throat> all tetrapods, all, all what was that? All tetrapods, which means four legged animals, have, especially on land, let's say all land dwelling vertebrates have five digits per limb, which may seem obvious to you but it's actually kind of interesting because that wasn't that's not the case for all species so i think in some of the classes hold on i'm going to actually show something in some of the classes i show i show this thing um right i've shown some of you this thing this is a canthostega which uh, is one of our one of the earliest tetrapods and and when we kind of think about the details or try to observe differences between it and what we expect one of the things that invariably comes up here is that it has five uh more than five digits it has eight digits per limb so that was one of the early cues back in this is june 1995 back in the mid 90s that was one of the first cues that this was actually not an ancestor of ours and it turned out it wasn't um it, it was on a different evolutionary branch and it did not lead to land animals but all land vertebrates have five digits now you might go wait wait a minute like t-rex has two actually during development it has five and then the others degenerate and and the same sort of process seems to be happening here if we if you look back at uh Oh, those of you who are freshmen, if you can't see what's on my screen, if you click me and pin me, you can see me for a bit and then you can unpin me and see the rest of the presentation. Um, but if you look if you look back at figure 1B uh, that RC is showing, it has five digits and then it has this like extra thing. It's like polydactyly going on. Uh, this might ruin pastry for you, but when you when you eat a bear claw, a lot of times you'll see it has like nine, eight or nine digits. You should bring it back because that's anatomically incorrect. A bear claw does not have eight or nine digits. Okay. I know that would be an important thing for you guys. So, okay. RC. So the rest of the paper then gets into the, uh, what they think is probably the genetic cause for a lot of the similarities you see. Uh, it deals with a protein called DYNC2H1. Is there a like, name for that, Nardachar? Or is it just... Uh, say, say it again. D DYNC2H1. DY is dynein. It's, okay, the dynein. Motor. it's the motor for the cilia. Okay, so the dynein protein. And in this part of the figure shows like once again like a phylogenetic tree so this is like a massive just compilation of all the different uh the relatives of varying distance to the two species and at, at the 3128th amino acid which is demonstrated on this uh, chain here there's a mutation in both species uh that's an, a substitution i believe of an R gene for a guanine, or an adenine for a guanine. Sorry. And what this does is it change it changes what amino acid is actually present. So on this table here, it's kind of small. Or you can look here. Uh, AGG is um, AGG is uh, R gene. And right, uh, hold on. Let, let's, especially for the freshmen who yeah. haven't had this yet, he's he is looking at a at. If you look at um, the the yellow highlighted column in Figure Two, the yellow is highlighting the codon 
Okay, so you, what you see is it's, it seems to be highly conserved as AGG. If you go on the right and look in the codon table, AGG, AGG would give you an arginine. But in those two species, it's been mutated into AAG. So AAG gives you a K, a lysine. So you can kind of follow along. And if you're advanced, well, I'll let RC do it. Go ahead, go ahead RC. And so those, the change in actual amino acid, you can see the two amino acids here. The arginine, which is um, in all other species, except for those two, uh, has extra, I, I can't see the actual group. So there's extra groups on the one end of it. And the lysine, which is a similar structure, is missing those extra groups. Mm -hmm. And that changes then like the functionality of the actual protein. And they're amino groups and they're charged. So a lysine is way more charged. I'm sorry, a lysine is way less charged than an arginine is. Arginine has three different um, has three different um, amine groups that are charged, whereas lysine only has one. So everybody should know this. If you change the charge you're of one amino acid, it's going to change the way it folds, right? And the significance of that change in charge uh, has to deal with what the actual protein does. So it's involved in something called the sonic hedgehog signaling pathway. And this pathway is in like prenatal and then actual like early life. It's involved in the development of uh, appendages and the actual structure of species. So in, and they know this from testing and then also what they've seen in humans and mice. If there's a mutation or uh, any effect on this gene, it'll cause, it can cause polydactility, which is like extra digits on hands but it can also just cause like completely malformed structure. So a species as a whole or an individual as a whole, if they have a mutation on the, the dynein uh, protein will not develop the way it's supposed to. And since these two species, the red and giant pandas have a mutation, so, uh, the scientists who like did this paper are assuming that it then plays a role in their development of the pseudo thumb. They don't, I, they never um it wasn't like proven that that's what the gene specifically did but it gave them some sort of association to the genetic cause of that that we previously previously did not have for these two species and it's interesting like evolutionarily because like you can see even in species more closely related to the uh red panda so the red panda is the one at the top uh uh, all, all the melon, no Luca, even a closer related species, like the one below it, the Ursus smartimus, it doesn't have that mutation, but the red panda, which is farther like distant has that mutation. And this can be accounted for by their environment because they both live in bamboo forests, which is, has very specific and particular diet because there's not like too much sustenance other than the bamboo. And eating the bamboo, the extra digit helps them to grab the leaves and then eat them. And so they're assuming that uh, at some point there was, it became advantageous to each of them for eating bamboo to develop in the same way, despite being so distantly related. Part C of this just demonstrates the actual function of the dynein in like the, in the cilia formation. The cilia is what actually pushes parts of the like panda when it's developing, like pushes different appendages out or works to like shape it into whatever it's supposed to functionally be. I think I think it's more that it works to wave the signal. Like it actually does this. You can see it under a microscope where cilia, cilia on the 
on the surface of an embryo will actually wave like this and push chemicals away from it. And those chemicals are the signaling molecules. So you'll have a really high concentration where the cilia are, and then it'll go further, you know, the further away you get from there, the lower the concentration. And if you're, if the signal, are you going to explain hedgehog? Um, I, I don't know it well enough I, to be able to, like, I remember what we talked about yesterday. I don't have a, like, okay. I don't get a comprehensive grasp. That's okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, when you're done, I'm going to show you guys a tool that they used, which I think is super cool. Um, and I'll, I'll use hedgehog as the example, but yeah. imagine it's just a signal that you need to, you need to form a body or, or some sort of pattern. Well, how does it know? How does the skin know to form that pattern? Well, because it's because it's receiving signals from an area. I think um, in AP Bio today, we talked about notochord formation in neural crest cells and dog color, I think, right? Um, and in genetics, which was right before my meeting with RC yesterday, uh, we, we talked about the same sort of thing where you're sending signals away Right, and those genes are controlling. The genes are recipes for proteins that control how the spread of that signal works. That's kind of what's happening here. And so this is a diagram just demonstrating the actual role and the structure of the cilia that the dynein play, uh, the dynein plays. And so then, did the did it change? Uh, um, beyond the actual pseudothumb, another interesting similarity between the two is their digestion. So both red and giant pandas are carnivore, carnivores, but they have an herbivorous diet, which means that they're designed to eat meat, like their biological structures to eat meat, but in practicality, they end up eating only bamboo. And this can cause a bunch of issues if they weren't properly evolved to do so. It's a sense they were both. Uh, evolved in a bamboo rich environment and at some point switched to a entirely bamboo diet they developed different uh, enzymes and proteins that allow them to better digest bamboo despite its discrepancies towards uh, meat so each of these plays a different role in their like this is all of the genes so some of them like the dynein protein that deals with the pseudothumb. Uh, the PCNT also helps with the uh, development of the pseudothumb. And they both pretty much help to create the cilia that Dr. Char was talking about that push in, they push different chemicals across the cell. And so bamboo compared to meat is fairly nutrient deficient. It doesn't have a lot of the the proteins or vitamins that the pandas need and would get from meat if they were eating a meat diet. One thing specifically was uh, like Dr. Char was talking about before, the difference between arginine and lysine. Lysine, Dr. Char, lysine is the one that you need to eat, correct? Correct. Uh, uh, so lysine, you have to actually consume from another organism and it can't be produced in the pandas. And Bam, uh, bamboo isn't as rich in lysine as like a different organism might be. And these proteins or these enzymes help to better extract the arginine and lysine from the bamboo because the, like a mammal, like a, like a black bear, for example, wouldn't have these enzymes to actually extract the amount of lysine and arginine that they need to actually then as shown like here to be used in the pandas like genome the ones on the bottom deal with uh b12 deficiency or vitamin b12 deficiency uh cp or, or sorry gif um deals with the actual absorption of B12. So this allows it to better absorb the amount of B12 that is in bamboo. And they're still from that, not able to get enough B12 and affect a vitamin B and uh, uh, experience a vitamin 12 
vitamin B12 deficiency. And that causes angiosclerosis, which is a cardiovas cardiovascular issue. And this gene, the cytochrome P50, actually decreases the effect of the uh, angiosclerosis the effect that it has on the pandas. So though they might have some effect from it, it's not going to be as detrimental as if they were just experiencing it without this enzyme. The bottom two uh, deal with vitamin A deficiency, which is also lacking in bamboo compared to meat. And vitamin A is very essential for their dark vision. So like vision at night, because both pandas um, operate both in the day and nighttime. So they need to be able to see at night to actually like, get around. And the alcohol dehydrogenase, there is a, a chemical called retinol and then another one called retin. How is the pronounced differently? Retinol and retinol. Uh, so there's retinol and retinol. And the alcohol dehydrogenase actually converts retinol uh, and retinol between each other. So it deals with creating a like, concentration that works for the panda's body to then be used in the formation of parts of the iris, which they need to actually see at night in darker vision. No, I think it's, I think it's rods and cones. Right? Retinal is used in, uh, specifically in rods uh, for vision in the retina. Yeah, the retina, sorry. And then... The cytochrome, the other cytochrome P50 of P450 deals with actually managing the concentration of retinoic acid, which is just naturally created in the pandas. And so all these things are particular to these two species compared to the relatives. And you can see how each one is actually like a function or came about because of their environment. The lack of bamboo uh the lack of nutrients in bamboo uh cause pretty much these last like six or seven genes to develop so that they can better absorb and and like actually use bamboo as their main source of sustenance whereas the first two help them with the extra digit which is then used to actually eat the bamboo because it allows them to grab it in a way that they wouldn't be able to otherwise the last specific uh the last change or like convergent evolution that we see is in the umami taste receptors umami is a flavor that is found commonly in meat and so like a carnivore for example like what you would expect as a normal carnivore that is actually eating meat rather than these two species they both they experience the umami taste when they're eating meat and since both pandas while still being carnivores, are on a completely herbivorous diet. They're not actually using that taste receptor. And in both of them, you can see via different methods, a knockout or pseudo pseudogenization, which is pretty much when you lose the function of a gene, it, uh, it's no longer actually working for them. And the deletion here uh, on the six chromosome for the red panda means that the gene just doesn't work for them. It, they, they don't have any umami taste because they're not tasting anything that has that, that flavor or like that, like taste profile. And on the giant panda, it's a bit more complicated, but there's a insertion and then two deletions that mean likewise, the giant panda actually loses the, like ability to taste the umami flavor and this is like like the function of this gene didn't actually have any benefit to them and so over time as they were continually eating the bamboo diet it like fell out of use it wasn't that change wasn't selected against yeah yeah I, I, I just freeze there for a second mm -hmm. um if you didn't have an appreciation for the power of a frame shift mutation. You can see that this convergent evolution between red and giant pandas are not really this on a on a nucleotide level, but they are on a protein level, right? You get the same result in red panda as you do in giant panda two different ways. 
And the red panda is able to do it with one tiny change. One deletion means the whole protein doesn't work. And that's pretty, pretty amazing, right? About how, how come, how can life even exist when a one nucleotide change can kill an entire protein, the function of an entire protein, but it does. So. Um, so conclusions and implications, uh, like due to their similar environmental pressures, they evolved convergently, meaning their evolution while taking a different route, like they're not coming from the same species, they're coming from a different, they, they split like a fairly long time ago from a common ancestor, but then through evolution, they eventually came back to exhibit a lot of the same traits. Specifically, that's their pseudothumbs, digestive enzymes, and the loss of umami taste receptors. And this is like the one part of the paper like in the conclusion, well, I think that a lot of what it's talking about is like it's true and it, it conveys it well. It it doesn't seem to have, at least to me, like that great of an implication. It's more so just a way of demonstrating convergent evolution genetically, which they say isn't often done. So it's a good example to be used, but it wasn't at least uh, it didn't seem to like make any large statements or changes to what was already understood about both species individually. Okay. Um, do you think it deserved to be published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, which is a journal with a about a 10 or 11 impact factor, which is really quite good? Um, I think it probably would have been better suited for something more like specific to like its topic, like whether it's like something that dealing with actual like, like evolution or something, I guess, more like, like it didn't feel like it was suited for something as like broad, like broad and as you said, the like high impact as this journal, though I think it's, it has, it definitely has merit and there's something to be gained from it. It's not that the paper itself was inherently bad or like not like well like written. It was just that the implication of the paper doesn't necessarily match the impact of the journal. Okay. Um, you can stop sharing your uh, screen. I'm gonna we can have a bit of a discussion here because there's a, a lot of stuff to cover. Does anyone does anyone else have any comments or criticisms or critiques of the paper or RC's presentation? I just I just have like a common question. So the red panda and the giant panda are not the same species, but over time they were able to converge back into like the same. Uh, it's not that they're the same. It's not that they're the same species or family. They're still different species and fairly unrelated genetically. But at like a, like forty seven million years ago, there some common ancestors split, and like a red panda is more related to a ferret than it is to an actual like giant panda. But they still exhibit a lot of similar traits and got to a point where a lot of their features are very similar, simply because they were living in very similar environments. So this brings up like the nature nurture thing where it's like the similar environment can bring two species, two different species back into like the same type, if you could call it that. Yeah, I don't know if I would say that it's nature nurture because I think this is just a really good demonstration of nature. Because, because again, this is not how anyone likes to think about evolution, but how does most evolution happen? By mistake. By mistake. Okay, but what's the result? Genetic diversity. In order to get genetic diversity, how do you, how do you get there? Mutations. Optimization. Things death? Death. Things have to die. Like nobody really likes talking about that implication of evolution, but I, I try to talk about it as nature is select and as if nature is thinking about it, it's not right. It's just pure chance, but nature selects against some features and for other features. Um, if you look at, I'm going to pull it up on my, let's see, let's do this. Oops. If you look at this, uh, which RC had shown before, 
right here. So here's a red panda. And you can see it actually looks a lot like a raccoon. It's closer related to a raccoon than it is to a giant panda. But it shares some of the features. And I think one of the reasons why it would get into a decent journal is that up until probably the 90s, actually, I think it was around 2000, up until then, we still weren't even sure if pandas, giant pandas were bears. There was this story that they were actually closer related to a raccoon than they are to a bear. And only very recently through genetic work have they actually been able to show that no, no, pandas are bears. So if you look at this figure, uh, this yeah, this figure here, B, which is what um, RC just showed. If you look at the name of the species, you see that how do you how do you pronounce this RC? Ileropoda melanleuca. Melanleuca just means uh, black uh, black spotted, but Ileropoda is not Ursus. It's not a bear. In fact, it shares a name with with the red panda, which is Il Alurus, I guess. Those of you who speak Latin, correct me because I don't. Il Ileropoda and Ileurus, because they were actually thought to be related. And and those of you not so not the honors kids, but but uh, the ones who've had honors biology and, and beyond, you know that there's like morphological characteristics that people that that species were categorized by. And then you can sort of understand why a red and a and a giant panda would be grouped together because they have this weird thumb looking thing that's not a thumb. It's just like a bone spur, uh, a pseudo thumb. Uh, and so they were kind of grouped together. So so this is kind of interesting because it's showing no no we now know that these that giant pandas are bears are bears but there was some convergent evolution of things that are unrelated because uh early on rc used the used the term de novo which means brand new or newly derived so when when he says that this these mutations happened de novo in both species it means that even though they share a common ancestor it's not that common as ancestor that had that genetic change they actually came to it themselves uh convergent evolution like bats birds and insects all having wings right but they didn't all actually evolve from a common ancestor that had wings in fact the common ancestor of flies and birds was an animal was an was an animal 650 million years ago that didn't look anything like either of them because it was in the ocean so um also just to mention the panda the red panda genome had to be like completely like mapped that was the de novo but the giant panda there was already some information and they just kind of like revamped it right and and so so th the whole the whole thing about knowing whether uh, giant pandas a bear or not came from that original um, sequencing because they were they were able to compare it to grizzlies and polar bears because the polar bear one had been done fairly early on because it's an endangered species uh, so the and and so they did the the other one and that okay oh well, we found out that that a, that a panda bear is a bear cool fine but this is the first time that the red panda had been sequenced. And let's all put this in perspective, okay? The, the first sequence to be done on a mass scale was, I think it was mice, but let's say human, okay? The Human Genome Project cost $10 billion from 1990 to 2000. $10 billion. It took 10 years. This group, okay, wh why is this important? This is important because this group here who did who did this paper they did the sequence by themselves for this paper like there, there was a time when if you if you and your team sequenced the genome of an entire species you made it onto the cover of nature or science and in 2017 it had become so common 
that they went and sequenced the entire genome of the red panda and only got their paper into PNAS. So knowing that, RC, would you change your mind? Should Does it belong in PNAS? I mean, I don't think then it'd be a unique accomplishment. Like, it's more so I feel like then the merit of the technology of the time rather than the merit of the paper itself. Like, that specific aspect of it. Okay. Okay. But I, 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 I think it's a good marker of development and change. Yeah. But I don't know that, like, demonstrating that changes happen should then be... The only reason? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, just, just as an extreme example, I have a copy of Science Magazine from 2006-ish with a picture of a sea urchin and the big news on science, okay, again, one of the top four sexy ones, okay, so like sea urchin genome sequenced. Who cares about a sea urchin? Like, why would that be important at all? But it made it on the cover of science. So think about how the mighty have fallen here. You get, if you sequence the red panda genome 10 years earlier, it would have been on the cover of nature, science, cell. It would have been a major story. And instead it's in proceedings of the National Academy of Science because of some thumbs and umami taste receptors. So that's a little, it's a, it's a little sad kind of that, that that's the case. Anybody else have other comments? Marco, I see you're like about to say something. Yeah, I was just going to say that if this was 10 years ago, then now we've evolved so much in our advancements that this gets into a lower paper. So I feel like it's a good thing that it's in that paper instead of like cell or nature. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Although it didn't help me out much when I, uh, I discovered a polymorphism a variant in a in an important circadian gene it was the first discovery i made when i was in graduate school and my one of my thesis advisors was like oh if this was two years ago you would have been on the cover of science for discovering a polymorphism and and then we ended up publishing it in some podunk journal called the journal of biological rhythms which which is a great journal in my field but it's not it's not science you know so that progress hurt me personally, and I'm quite offended. Um, all right, what else? RC was supposed to call on people and didn't. I didn't know how to, like, stop and call on somebody without, like, making it awkward. No, I mean, because it's, that's part of the game. Now, I understand RC actually did this very last minute because I asked him last minute. Uh, I thought, remember, I, when we were planning this last week, he wasn't there. And I was like, I bet RC would want to go first. So I did ask him. He said, yes, he did a good job. Um, but, but Marco, you're next week. You're calling on people. Okay. Definitely calling people. Yeah. And, and it, you know, I, I don't, yeah. So calling people, that'd be good. Uh, other, other things I wanted to point out. The yeah. Sonic Hedgehog wanted to. Yeah. Right. Well, first, I wanted to explain what something RC was doing in passing, but not explaining why he was doing it. So give me a second. I'm going to go to, uh, no, slides. Oh, okay. So in his presentation, he was showing these to actually show you that you've seen this before. So honors bio kids, you'll see this later in the year, but everyone else has seen this already because it's in your textbook. And, and so you were able to actually go, okay, here are all of the ancestors, all of the tetrapods, essentially, and how they break into all the mammals and how related they are. And then, and then over, oops, I keep doing that. And then over here, looking at just a, a type of eutherian, which is a carnivore, this is from your textbook. And if you look at just those, car, those, those in the group of Ursus and Mustilidae, you get all of these things. So you're talking about weasels, ferrets, um, otters, wolverines, badgers, raccoons. Those are all mustilidae. Uh, 
and they are they're closer related to bears than they are to the other carnivores like like dogs and cats dogs are closer related to mustelids and bears than they are to cats then uh then there was an interesting yeah if you look at this one this is kind of cool if you're looking at millions of years ago here then humans and mice are way closer related to each other than like red pandas and mice are right and and I think I, I also wanted to say one last thing about this. The this is an example that goes against what we call parsimony. So if you remember from if you remember from your honors bio work or your AP biology work, when we're talking about evolution, and you want to have the fewest branch points possible, right? Because that's the most likely way that something evolved. This is not showing that. This is showing that actually you can still have very similar mutations leading to the same outcome, but have had them at different times coincidentally. That does happen. It's just not as common. Uh, the last thing I wanted to show you, so I'm going to go to get rid of that. And I'm going to go to, oh, no, wait, I do want that. Um, and that's this. This is a tool they used. Let me see if I can get it to fit correctly in your screen. Yeah. So this is a, this is a tool they used, and this is something you should take note of. Okay, this should be something you use in the future or remember that you can use. Because I, I know for years I've been thinking about this tool and couldn't remember the name of it until I read today's paper. I was like, oh, that's what it is. And I didn't look very hard, but but that's what it, I used to use this a lot when I was in uh, my third postdoc. Because if you're trying to understand how certain genes are related to each other, what they might have to do with each other, this is the resource to look at. Okay, So you can actually put in keywords, like you can put in the gene names, or you can put in like a pathway. So in this case, I'm going to say hedgehog, Sonic Hedgehog, which is named after the the uh, video game character, right? Will this will actually show how Hedgehog works in a network? This is the Hedgehog signaling pathway. Now, I don't expect you all to know this or understand this, but once you do understand how things how pathways work, this is a pretty quick way to do it. And look, hedgehog signaling, the very first pathway that comes up has to do with cilia. So it's one of the most important ones. And so I know it from early development of bilateralism. So if, if I cut you, this is what we were talking about in genetics. If I cut a person in half, generally one side of them looks like the other side, right? You are bilateral. Well, how do you become bilateral? This is how, okay? Hedgehog is the thing that's doing it. So hedgehog is a, is a protein signal that is sent out and, and cilia are used to actually like wave it away. So you have a concentration gradient and receptors on other cells smell the hedgehog and based on its concentration decide to become a certain body part. So the farther away from the midline you are, the less hedgehog you smell. Therefore, those cells know to become lateral things like arms. Whereas if you're more towards the center, it, those cells can smell higher concentrations of hedgehog and know, oh, I'm at the center, so I should probably be a nose. That makes sense. There are some. There are certain chemicals in nature that are found in certain plants, certain edible plants. They're alkaloid chemicals, um, and and so you see this sometimes in farm animals, where if a pregnant, if a pregnant goat or something goes and eats this weed, I can't remember the name of the weed. The, the, the alkaloid chemical in the weed actually blocks sonic hedgehog receptors 
And so when the goat goes and has has or, billies, I guess they're called, right? Billies? No, what are they called? What are baby goats? Lambs. Kids. 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 When it has a kid, a lot of times those kids have only one eye in the center of their forehead. They're cyclopses, cy cyclopia. Cyclopia happens usually because of environmental stuff, like a, a the, the mom ate something that then blocked it at just the right time so that you end up with a baby, human baby, that has only one eye. It's a real thing. It inspired all of the mythology about Cyclopses. And it has to do with Sonic Hedgehog. So you learn something. But but more importantly, you, you learned that this tool exists here. And this tool is very, very useful. Whenever you want to see, all right, uh, you, you, you do, a, I actually use this um, in some of my data where I went and did a sequence just like they did to see, okay, what's the difference? And this is a nurture thing, Marco. What's the difference between the, the expression of certain genes in a normal animal and one that's experienced strobe lighting for four hours? So you've experienced something different. Same age, same development. What genes are turned on or off? So you go and you, you run their brains through the system and sequence them. And, and you get a whole list of, of genes that are different from each other. I take that list and I put it into keg and keg spits out, Oh, they're all related to this pathway, which then gives me an explanation of what might be going on in their brains. That's a really, really useful thing. Like if you tell a, if you're applying for a position in a lab next year, uh, seniors, if, you, if you're applying for a position and you have some experience using keg, that's a big plus just like the PCR stuff from the summer. Okay. Uh, what else? Marco, you're on Monday, I believe. Tuesday, Monday? Monday. Monday. Monday, except it's going to be regular time, so 8 o'clock. Uh, if you can't make it, let me know. Uh, and uh, this is how it's going to proceed. Okay. Any questions, comments, concerns? Chris? Um, you said we were supposed to circle things regarding figures. What were we supposed to circle? Just as an easy way, here, I'll show you. Let's say RC decided to actually call on you, Chris. Right? Here's the paper. This is actually the one I read, and this is how I read it. You'll see things that I thought were important I highlighted. And you'll also see that whenever I saw the word fig, I actually circled it in red so that if RC had called on me to explain figure one and I hadn't really understood it or I waited to the last minute and didn't really digest it, I at least know what's said about figure one. Right. So he, like this, I highlighted this was important. 133 genes evolved under strict molecular clock with a divergence time of 47.5 million years. Remember that uh, RC had said that previous estimates thought that they diverged, what, 30 something? I think it's 43 instead of 47. 43, so this is, this is suggesting it might've been earlier than we thought, right? And so I can, I now, the, this result is slightly higher than previous. So I, that now I know what the point of figure one was it's just a quick way of, it's a cheat. It's a way to cheat it if you get called on. So I go and I actually circle all of the figures. I don't, I don't really do that for supplementary figures. You can see like over here, a whole bunch of mentions, uh, table, figure S11, figure S11, S25, all those supplementary things. I don't, I don't really circle cause they're not as important, but the main figures and tables are what I circle in the, in the, uh, paper so I know what's important and I and I highlight and you may not think this is important to do this but you should keep you should keep your own little library of all the papers you've ever written so that 10 years from now when somebody brings something like this up in a conversation about like your your new experiment you'd be like wait a minute I think I've read that where did I read that and it's already highlighted for you so you know what's important and you could read it quicker. You don't have to read the whole thing anymore. 
You just go, what was important in here? Oh yeah, that's right. It, that really comes in handy. I have, I have thousands and thousands of papers in my, in my library that I carry around. Okay. All right. Well, good job, RC. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you guys. Well, I'll see probably you in person tomorrow, but uh, next meeting of the AMI is on Monday. So long. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Chad. Bye. 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 Bye.